Welcome to another CHRO Conversation, hosted by the Center for Executive Succession at the Darla Moore School of Business. I am your host, Anthony Nyberg, and today we are speaking with Kevin Cox. Kevin is the CHRO for GE. Prior to joining GE in 2019, he served as the CHRO of American Express Company since 2005. He also served on the corporate boards of the Kraft Heinz Company, Corporate Executive Board, or CEB, Virgin Mobile USA, and Chef's Warehouse. Kevin, as always, it is a tremendous treat to have you down here. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Good to be here. We know when a new CEO starts that a, an important part of that is putting together that executive leadership team. Can you describe some of the issues that go into choosing an effective leadership team? You know, I, I think um, the, the tough part about that question is there's a little context that matters um, on something like that. So if a, if a CEO is trying to drive change, and that's the case uh, in, in, in my case here at GE, then you're going to look at your leadership team through the lens of change. Um, that might lend itself to bringing in more people from the outside who might bring in different perspectives or um, a particular uh, type of expertise that, that the CEO thinks they need. So the first thing I would think of is that. How much change are you looking to drive versus how much sort of steady improvement are you looking to do? In our case, it was drive more radical change, more rapid change, and so that leads to, to, to that. That's to the selection of the team and balancing the right mix of internal expertise with this outside expertise. Once you do that, like any team, the next step is to make sure that they gel and they really work together effectively as a team. And that's what I think we spent time on as well. I wanna to get to that part, but before that, how do you get the right balance between the expertise that you want in a particular role on that executive leadership team and the ability to work well together? You'll get sparks uh, from time to time because I think those two can kind of clash uh, a little bit. Maybe that's the basis of your question. And I think a little bit of that friction is good. You know, heat, pressure makes a diamond, as they say. And so I, I think some of that is pretty good. And one of the things I try to do is be a regulator of that friction or that tension. I think that's a legitimate uh, role of a head of HR to try to do that. There are times when you want to pump the brakes and you want to slow it down a little bit because you feel like uh, this isn't going to a great place. We need to slow down and think about that. There are times when you want to accelerate that change and you want to let that happen. I work pretty hard to try to gauge that and try to balance that with the team and, and with the CEO. So the way you describe that, it, it sounds like the head of HR really does have a role in helping strengthen that executive leadership team. We do, but a, a occupational hazard. It's a team. And so I have made mistakes in the past where I didn't understand that by playing that role too much, I can actually throw off the center of gravity of that team. I uh, always was trying to do right for the company, but sometimes I didn't understand that, that I needed to be part of the team as well as this regulator, this braking device that I talked about. And then when I got that wrong, um, you can create jealousy, you can create factions, you can, you can fragment the team and that's not helping anybody. And so we've worked hard, I've worked hard to learn from that and not to repeat those mistakes, to be frank. So that does really highlight an interesting challenge. How do you balance being part of the team with having this extracurricular role of also helping probably both select some of those team members and help keep that team really gelling? I think of myself as a pretty simple guy, uh, meaning what you see is what you get. I start off with uh, personal relationships. So to me, if you and I were on the team together, if you were the CFO and I'm the head of HR, I'm gonna start by some kind of a meaningful personal connection with you to try to establish trust. And I'm going to do the things that, that would help you uh, trust me. I'm gonna keep your confidence if you wanna talk about something or complain about something, I wanna be your first safe place to go. And maybe I can help you with that. If there's something you're trying to get done from a functional agenda standpoint that's really important to you and your success, I'm gonna work hard to try to deliver for you so that you're more likely to be successful. I'm gonna do the kinds of things that start off with a, a good relationship individually. If I do that with everybody, I think then I can move to sort of the next rung, which is how do I get us to all sound good when we play together? 
and how do I think about that? Um, so that's that's the second step. Um, and third is, I guess, to understand I'm not perfect and uh, I shouldn't approach this as though I have all the answers and to be willing to take feedback from those same team members. You may give me feedback as a CFO that I need to listen to and I need to think more about. The very last thing is um, the minute you start being a politician on a team, I think you have lost your credibility. And so I always try to speak for myself, not to carry the CEO's mail. I, I don't come in and sort of say, well, you know, the CEO doesn't really want to say this to you directly, Anthony, but um, something that you really should know. At that point, I'm I'm becoming sort of an agent of the CEOs, and um, I think you're going to see me that way, and you're going to see me that way forever. I would much rather, um, Anthony, here's some feedback I have, some observations I have that I think would make you more effective on the team, and I'm speaking for myself. I haven't even talked to the CEO about this. It's between you and me for right now. So I work really hard not to be a politician or the mail carrier of someone else's message, but to own my own as, as best I can. And you've obviously been on executive leadership teams for a long time now, which if, depending on how we think of the configuration of one of people that have come on or left, otherwise uh, you've seen a lot of different executive leadership teams. Is there anything you'd point to that makes one much more effective or conversely you can say, oh, this is a disaster or at least not likely to be as successful? It's interesting. This, I think this sounds so simple, but it's, it's not that easy to get right. I would start off with... Um, the best teams I've been a part of have been super clear on the overall goal of the organization. And the priorities are really well aligned. And, and again, that sounds like basic, like MBO 101, right? But I've been on lots of teams where that's not the case. Um, could be a hub and spoke kind of deal where only the CEO knows how this all fits together and we're just sort of role players in in that arrangement and i i find that is a it's hard to have an effective team in a, in a situation like that but when we've taken the time to really uh, debate sometimes argue and align on the objectives of the organization that's a great starting point because now i feel like we're all rowing generally in the same direction uh, we all have each other's backs and i think that's a really foundational part I think it's important that um, we all understand that the whole really is greater than the sum of the parts. I think you have to approach the best teams I've been on have understood that one plus one can equal four or something like that. If we get this right, we build on each other. I think we have each other's backs. Um, business, I say this every year, it's, it's tougher this year than it was last year and it will be that way if I come back here and talk next year. It's just the way the world is working. So you need to have that kind of support for one another and that, that kind of empathy for one another's position. So those are some ingredients that I think are both present in the best teams I've been on and missing in the least best teams I've been on. You've been at, at iconic companies and GE of course is one of those also. Thinking about that, I mean, the long history and the culture that has been in GE and G is famous for their culture in a lot of ways. If you have to nudge that culture in directions that you, you are trying to achieve, how do you do that in a, in a company like a GE or, or American Express for that matter, or anywhere that has such a long, proud history? Nudge. That's an interesting verb. I don't think I'd use it. Um, I, I, I joke that I might have learned more about physics um, in, in HR than I learned when I was in 11th grade in physics. I mean, a culture of a 130-year-old company looks and feels a lot like a massive boulder, like a big, heavy rock, right? It, it, and you know that expression, an object at rest will remain at rest until something greater than. I feel that way about culture. And, um, and so a culture at GE, a company this big, this old, this global, this uh, iconic, um, doesn't want to change. I mean, it, it, it is, it kind of wants to be where it has been, like a cargo ship or something like that. So I wouldn't say nudge, I would say um, uh, push it hard and, and pick your spots and look for leverage to try to change this culture. So the leverage we have tried to change and are trying to change at GE is one of leadership behaviors. So we have three and only three leadership behaviors that we really feel are important. And they include things like humility. It's a starting part of that. We want a culture where 
and, and, and lean and as in Toyota production lean is really important to what we do. Humility for leaders means that you ask great questions, you just don't come up with all the answers. You're not in a game show where you are trying to be the fastest one to answer a question and prove what you know. You're actually trying to respect the machine operator, the shop floor, the, the field service technician, the people closer to your customer. You're trying to figure out how do I actually make your job easier, get out of the way, remove an obstacle that you're not able to remove without my help. That's sort of a form of humility. And that's an example of the leadership behaviors, one of the three that we're really working hard to try to change. I like our chances, um, even though it is a big rock. The other thing you learn about is momentum. And if you get that big rock to start to roll, it will roll. And I feel like that's we're maybe three years into that journey right now. I tell people it's probably a five year. I don't have any science behind that, Anthony, as you would know, but um, it, it's always felt like it probably is going to take closer to five years than not to really get that change to be meaningful and self-sustaining so that it could survive a change of leadership when that day comes and we wouldn't kind of go back to the way we were. I had always thought nudge because I thought you might be nervous about going in and, and really shaking up something for because of concern of how much pushback there might be, that it might be stronger. But you're saying no in those kind of really strong held places to make that change. You really have to hit it hard. If, yes, if your thesis is um, that you're looking to drive pretty radical change. You know, the, 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 the board of GE, and I wasn't around it when this happened, I came shortly thereafter, the board made a decision that it wanted to change CEOs. And the board made the decision to bring in the first outside CEO in GE's history. Those are signals to me that the board is looking for change. And so I believe Larry comes in on a platform or a mandate to drive change. And Larry um, hires me, I think, because he's looking for a partner to help drive change. So if those conditions are true, I don't think it's a nudge. I, I think that expression kind of go big or go home, you, you, have to, you have to hit it pretty hard to get the organization's attention and to get the organization to move. If it were an internal succession, if the business was in relatively good shape, if the board's determination is more of the same, just a little faster and a little louder. I don't think you, I think nudge would be highly appropriate there. Um, at my former company, um, which we had a, an iconic CEO succeeded by an internal candidate, I would say he nudged that culture. There were some changes he wanted to make that were important, but I would say they were of a, of a, a meaningful nature, but they were not of a transformative nature, and he would be the first to admit that. And trying to make these these transformative changes that you're working on now, has the pandemic, how has that altered how, how easily or challenging it is to alter a culture? It's an interesting mix of both. Um, so it, it does feel like it costs us a year or maybe two. Um, we're not able to gather um, physically, uh, we, well, there was a period of time we couldn't do any of that at all. We're starting to do more of that now. But the, the glue that I think holds an organization together is often brought about by, by being in the same place. So we've had that headwind, had that working against us. I think that slows us down. On the other hand, we've tried to make our technology solutions, as I'm sure everybody that's watching this has done as well, live pretty hard and work pretty hard. And we've connected with lots and lots of people uh, via video screens and gotten our message directly there in ways that we probably wouldn't have thought to do before. You know, I, I'm still sorting all this out as to what's better and what's worse. But for example, I know I can reach more people more quickly through a technology platform than I can if I'm traveling to Europe or to Asia or to South America or something like that. I can just reach more people. Is the effectiveness of that the same as if I'm there? I'm not yet sure, but my reach, like my, my ability to touch more people more directly is pretty high. We do roundtables in the organization virtually right now far more than we were doing before the pandemic. So our message is getting more factory direct, deeper in the organization, and I think we're trying to move through what can sometimes be permafrost in an organization. You know, your message gets trapped by middle management a little bit. 
And I think we're able to kind of penetrate that, that permafrost as a result of some of what we're doing in technology. So it's kind of a mixed bag. So it, it seems like, uh, particularly when you're talking about the, the changing of the way you want kind of want some of your leadership principles, that in a situation like with the pandemic, using this technology, you're probably able to exhibit and show those very principles that you want to live to more people. But at the same time, it, it, we know that culture gets transmitted through storytelling and interaction. How do, we, how do we, in a situation like this, when people are not coming together as much, what, what can organizations do to try to help that aspect also? I'm a big believer in what you said about storytelling, so I would just endorse that. I do think that is a huge lever in how you change a culture. So we simply tell those stories maybe through technical media. I mean, that, that's, um, so our, our leadership meetings, which used to literally be physical gatherings in places, first of all, we're doing more of them now. So it used to be that we do an annual leadership meeting once a year. Now we're doing them as many as three times a year. Why? Well, it's cheaper. Um, we can do more of those more cost effectively. We can do it more in sort of time release fashion. Uh, and we can deliver some pretty great content. We might pack it in a little bit tighter. We might run it a little bit shorter. Um, but we can deliver some excellent content, excellent external perspectives and speakers that we can bring in. And we can open that up to more people than we could have really afforded to bring into a common place. That's great. That's actually positive. That's what I mean. In that regard, nothing but upside. The let's sit beside each other for dinner and talk a little bit, that's missing. So that's not there, that's a negative. Um, the let's you and I walk back to the cottage where we are, both of our rooms are, and along that conversation, we might talk a little bit about, hey, we ought to work together on this. You're working on sales capability over here. I've got that same issue here. We're in a different division. We ought to kind of connect on that. That isn't happening right now, and I think that's what still is in front of us. So there's pros and cons. Do you see coming up with a blend of that going forward? That's kind of my definition of hybrid. Everybody has their, their own, but I, I, I do think that this pandemic will permanently change a lot. Uh, it's changing how we teach, therefore how we learn, how we share, how we showcase, things like that. And I think a lot of those practices will stay with us. On the other hand, I can't find anybody at my company that wants to continue to live this way indefinitely and we miss the ability to, to be with each other in three dimensions. And uh, so what will that balance be? I don't really know. It was it 50 50. Um, and I'm not talking about days in the office versus days at home. I'm just talking about the way we convene versus the way we disseminate information through through technology. Are there other lessons that you or things you could point to directly that have kind of come from the pandemic that you would point to and say, yeah, these are these are things that are changing or, or things we wish we could change or we'd, we'd be better served if we could change? Well, you know you're talking to a fundamentally a proud card-carrying HR guy. And so I, I have to say that um, empathy has, and the need for more of it has become much clearer to me in this pandemic. Um, meaning um, when you ask why we're having resignation and attrition at levels we haven't seen before as most companies are having right now some large part of that is the fact that people have needs that are not being attended to and leaders are not as attuned to those needs as they really need to be now would that be different if you're coming to the office and seeing every day maybe but right now uh, what we need a higher dose of is leaders who are who are asking more questions about how are you doing what can i do to help where are you stuck? Can I get you unstuck? Um, where do you need a partner? Can I find a partner for you? I think more of that is is really can, in demand. Can you go even deeper into that? Because you are already my example of someone who really strongly believed in empathy and in the importance of that in leading, even well before the pandemic. So for you to say you're seeing that even more, I find really striking. Well, I appreciate that compliment, but people need more. And so whatever, whatever, let's say I was uh, a, a seven on the empathy scale before, they need a nine or a 10 or maybe even an 11 right now. And it's just, um, I just, I think it comes from the trauma really of this pandemic. And one day, not soon, but one day it will be clear sort of how much damage has been done. 
by the alteration of, of how we've been living through this thing. It isn't clear, but people are more anxious than they've ever been. People are sleeping less well than they've ever slept. People are eating more poorly than they've ever eaten, and they're drinking more alcohol than they've ever. So, so the evidence is irrefutable to me that this is sort of um, affecting people in pretty harmful ways. Um, and that shows up at the workplace. And I think our job as a leader is to try to try to deal with some of that. I, I, I really do try to start my one-on-one -on -one conversations with my team with some form of a, how are you doing? And they'll say, fine. And I'll say, I, I mean it. Like, how are your kids? Well, actually, we're trying to look for colleges right now, and it's really hard. It, it's always hard, but it's really hard in a pandemic to do something like that. Let's spend some time talking about that right now. Um, you know, my mother's lonely and we don't see her as much because of the pandemic and we worry about her health and so we don't see her. Well, let's, let's talk about that. And so I just would say um, more time being aware of the struggles people have is important right now. And then from a career standpoint, being more focused on how's this job working for you? Um, how happy are you in it? What can I do to kind of help you um, uh, feel like you're thriving more in this job? That's a part of it too. So I am far from perfect, but I, I, I do try to tell myself more of that right now is not only a nice thing to do, it's actually essential. If I want to not only keep people, but keep them engaged and giving us everything that they're able to give us. And when you're coaching other senior business leaders on that, either inside the organization or externally, are they receptive or do they understand that? Many people of our generation would have really been, would have not come with that particular perspective. Yeah, it's tough. It, it, it's not easy. And some, some grab it instinctively and some look at me like, sounds like something an HR guy would say. Um, important though is that, you know how the airlines tell you, uh, put the mask on yourself before you apply on somebody else. There are some of those very leaders I'm talking to that are in their own form of pain. And so some of the breakthrough is, how are you doing? Before I sort of coach you on how you might be a better leader, is anybody talking to you about how you're doing? Because you're human also, and you've got a family also, and you're under a lot of pressure also. And that helps a little bit too. And I, I find sometimes by role modeling that with them, I don't have to say as much. They may sort of pay that forward. That's at least what I'm hoping. But you know, there's a bell curve in any company and some, some don't even need it. Some will never ever get it. And I sort of play for the middle, which I believe wants to, wants to get to the good side. And it, it's, it's almost an absurd question to ask, what is the future of the workplace kind of thing? But you're one of the most thoughtful people I know in this area. So in addition to what we need to do from an HR perspective, that empathy issue, do you see other changes on the horizon of, of the workforce in general? Every time I say this, people snicker, but it is where I start. So my, my astrology sign is a Libra. I was born in September, and, and the, the Libra in quality is, I, I really sort of seek balance, and I'm allergic to hype. I, I really, really watch the hype from either side if there are two sides of it. I don't think things change as fast as most people or the media sort of wants to report. I think people are fundamentally kind of, they look for a steady state. I think people resist change. And so all those forces kind of um, hedge against these radical things that you read about and you hear about. That said, I do think this will permanently change um, the way work is done in the future of work. We just talked about um, how technology will affect the way I go about my business. So predictions. Um, I do think business travel will change. I don't think it's going to go to zero and I, I don't believe sort of some of the sky is falling kind of concerns about that. But I do think there are meetings people will uh, no longer go to in person that they might effectively do through technology. And that is a portion of business travel. I do think that workplace um, physical layouts will change. That's expensive. There's a lot of capital involved in that. I've seen some really interesting designs, but just like open architecture was sort of a trend or a theme over the past 15 years or so, I think workspace is going to get configured to set up for more hybrid work, uh, more technology friendly, sort of best of both worlds. Um, I'm physically in person, um, but technology is going to work for me better there. 
watch parties, for example, could be a bigger thing where um, content might be piped in on a screen, but we actually might get the benefit of watching that together from a remote site. That's a best of both worlds thing that I think could be an important part of the future of work. Um, those are just some of the ideas that, that I have. Um, I think a traditional five-day work week is in danger, uh, if, if you want to view it that way. I, I do believe people have become more attenuated to how I spend my free time, how much time I'm spending commuting, how good that is or bad that is for the environment, uh, quality of life considerations. So I think that um, more permissive where you work from policy is certainly, um, that train's left the station. I don't see it going back. How far it goes, we could debate. But, um, but I think those will, be, those will be pretty permanent changes. A lot more companies now kind of on these changes that are, are either putting themselves out there for social issues or pulling themselves back from social issues and the issues run the whole gambit from environmental change to voting rights to what state should you be in, et cetera, et cetera. How should organizations be thinking about when to dip their toe into these discussions and when to refrain from them? So far, that's your toughest question, at least the way I see it. It's a really important one, though. Um, I sort of grew up in a time where I, I always thought, I guess it's probably balanced scorecard thinking. I always thought about some combination of a triangle of the customer, the shareholder, the employee, you know, and that, that our job as leadership was to get that right, get the balance of that right. And that's hard. The, the, there are times when favoring the investor goes against the employee, et cetera. You should never not favor the customer. You do that at your own peril. Maybe there's a diamond now. Maybe there's a fourth leg, and, and you might think about that as the ESG uh, side of things. I think that is a permanent change. Um, I spend more time with investors than I used to. Um, it is impossible to have a, a phone call with investors without having a serious amount of time spent on environmental issues, social issues, governance issues, and things like that. I don't see that genie ever going back in the bottle, so I think that's permanent. So I, I think we, as leaders, we have to think about a fourth dimension of this, part one. And then part two is how much do you speak about that? That's the tricky part. Um, I do read the surveys that say more and more people want to hear their CEOs speak out on social issues. The Libra in me says, I think they mean I want to hear them speak out on issues that I agree with. <laughs> yes, for sure. And I don't think they want to hear from CEOs who have positions they don't agree with. So my advice to CEOs would be proceed with extreme caution on that. Um, talk about only what is relevant and truly relevant to your business. And I don't believe most people go to work to hear their CEOs' views on religion or their views on politics or their views on other kinds of issues. I think they come to work wanting to believe that um, as a form of diversity, we, sh we all should be able to work here. If we really line up around the purpose of the company and what it's really there to try to do, that should be the glue that holds us together. If we're aligned on purpose, I think we can be from the right or from the left or from any other point in between, and we ought to be able to kind of find enough common ground to work together. Otherwise, I kind of worry about where that goes over time and whether your culture ends up um, really being not hospitable to different forms of thought. I think about this for colleges all the time. All the time I worry about whether enough um, dissent is tolerated, whether enough different views are tolerated, and whether we're teaching people how to sort through different views versus maybe only line up behind one. So You mentioned the ESG and really focusing on purpose. In 2019, especially, there was a lot of hoopla about uh, like the business roundtable coming together and saying we are going to be broader in our perspectives of, of what our real attention goes to. Uh, some of the big investment firms were talking about how they're going to support broader purposes. Do you think that is that, and in the pandemic, probably highlighted a lot of these other issues, employees, the need to support employees, et cetera. Is that a real thing? Are, are companies really broadening their perspectives or are we going to quickly go back to where the stakeholders are the are the primary group kind of all the time Anthony I, I think it's I think it's permanent I, I, I really I really do I think um, the rate and pace at which it travels could be debated and I don't think it will be a quick 
a, a quick race, but I, I just think there are enough stakeholders that, and I'll, I'll just start with investors. Um, you know, the asset managers that hold most of the dollars that are invested in most of our companies have big votes and you ignore those votes at your peril. And whether you're talking about compensation issues or whether you're talking about environmental issues or sort of anything in between, human rights issues, diversity, um, I, I think you ignore that at your peril. And I don't think it's gonna be possible to, uh, to sort of uh, imagine that's not happening. And you believe those asset managers with those big votes really do see the broader picture, that it's not just their immediate return on, on dollar that's most important for them? I think they are... Um, or maybe not most important, but only thing important, I guess. Well, I think they're being responsive to the pension funds and the labor unions and the various constituents that contribute the money into the asset managers in the first place. And those are very real issues there. So, so I, I'm, not, I'm not here to do the work of an asset manager, but I think they have to be responsive to the sources of investment in order for them to be competitive. And in so doing, it's altering their, their view on what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. I think that trend continues. As, as wealth gets more concentrated and as asset managers grow in, in influence and significance, it's for another podcast to sort of debate the goodness and the, and the risk of that. But, um, but, but that trend is, is continuing right now with no breaks. So I see the students starting to line up uh, to hear you. And while I selfishly would like to just keep this going really quite all day for myself, I need to let you go. Um, but before I do, you were one of the, uh, you were really the, uh, the, one of the founding thought leaders for the Center for Executive Succession. Can you share why you thought that was important and why, if, if it's still working, why you think it is valuable today? First of all, I do think it's working. I'll, I'll start there. I'm really proud of, um, I'm proud of where this has come and, and where it continues to go. I think it's done good work in, in a nutshell. Um, I think succession, and I'm not just talking about CEO succession. It, one of the things I, I, I talked a lot with Pat right about at the beginning was it's about executive session, his succession, which includes CEOs, but isn't limited to that. I think it's an incredibly important subject for any company, number one. I feel like it was being dominated by um, anecdotal stories that uh, that were true, but don't really stand up to sort of um, rigorous thought. And I thought the beauty of taking a subject that's so important to companies with an academic research-based rigor would be a great idea. I, that, that was the kernel of the thought, is you've got some super important companies and something that an academic institution is by definition very good at. You merge those two things together and something interesting is gonna happen and you'll use data and you'll use fact to advance the science if you wanna think about that way of succession. That's what I was hoping for and that's what I'm seeing right now. So when I see the research reports, the topics the center looks at I love, the indications I have are really useful. I think they're very practical. Boards read them, CEOs read them, heads of HR read them, and I think we're advancing the cause. And I'm really, really proud to have been a, a, one of the original thought leaders of that, and even more proud of what leadership has done uh, since then. So I, it's on a great path, and I, I really celebrate it and encourage people to check us out and, and join it if, uh, if you have an interest in it. Now, truly, before I let you leave, I did remember one more of the thing that we were talking about yesterday that I really thought was uh, super interesting. You, I think you t mentioned that the difference between centralized and decentralized organizations really created vast differences for how you functioned in HR. It, am I capturing that correctly? And if so, can you say anything about that? I, I grew up in a couple of companies that I would characterized as centralized. And I am working at, at GE right now, which is um, um, very intentionally decentralized. Uh, La Larry, our CEO, could not be more clear about that's, that's how he views businesses as best being run. Um, he sort of uses an expression, they travel on their own bottoms, meaning that they, they really need to sort of earn their keep, pay their rent, they get closer to their customers, they get more responsive to issues, they get on things. There's not a tax layer of overhead and whatnot that they're as concerned about. So that's the world that I entered, that's the company I joined, and that's another change that he's working very hard to try to drive. 
Um, how I go about my business um, is different there because um, I would say my role is to be better at influencing versus controlling. That's it in a nutshell. Uh, there were times when in a centralized model um, I could get two votes and that's all I needed to take the thing all the way home. And at a company like GE, I probably need a dozen votes. It takes longer to get a dozen votes. It takes a lot more reciprocal relationship building to get those votes and hold those votes. I'm alliance building, and you can argue that that takes a long time, and it does take longer, but it makes you better. Uh, your arguments have to be better. They have to be more fact-based. They can't be as sloppy or is sort of emotional. They, they need to be really grounded in a fact. Almost the lowest common denominator. You've got to get everybody there. That makes me think harder. That makes me work harder. And I, I believe when you get the deal, it's more likely to stick because you've done the hard work of, of selling it all the way through. Um, I think about my job more like a prime minister than a president these days, in, in a nutshell. I, I think I've got a bully pulpit. I've got a reason to, to, to make a subject important. I've got convening power. I can get the right people in the room, but I don't have the same control that a president might have. That's not good or bad, it's just different, and it's been really good for this old dog to learn a few new tricks. It sounds like that's really closely aligned with the leadership principle you were talking about, really having to listen more. Absolutely. Is, is, that, is having that alignment between what you're trying to get leaders to do and the, the strategic outlook, is that essential? I think it is, and I don't think it's accidental. I think it's very much on point and, and on purpose in how we're, how we're trying to bring these leadership behaviors to life, how we're trying to link that to strategy, and fundamentally how we're trying to run the company in a different way. So that's, that's the journey. And again, we're still in the middle of the game. We're nowhere near the end of the game. Uh, but I really do like our chances, and I really do think this is going to make us a stronger, better company. And it's going to make me... It already is making me a, just a, a more versatile uh, head of HR. That's one of the reasons I wanted to be here. Again, thank you very much for joining us, for sharing your wisdom with our students, and for me personally. I sincerely appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Anthony. Thank yeah, you. good to be with you. You just listened to another CHRO conversation. Today, Kevin Cox of GE shared his views regarding how HR drives business success through the intersection of strategy, talent, and culture. Kevin also makes it clear that it is incumbent on all leaders to remember all of the people that they represent. On behalf of all of us who are associated with the Master of Human Resources program and the Center for Executive Succession here at the University of South Carolina, thank you for joining us.